death of Dalian Atkinson, two police officers go on trial. The court hears the former footballer was tasered, kicked and beaten and died soon afterwards. The officers deny they were to blame. Also tonight, supporters celebrate after two British soldiers are acquitted of murdering a member of the IRA 50 years ago. They didn't come here on holiday, they came over here to prevent civil war, they served their country. Uh, and for them, 50 years later, to be in, in court uh, on the stand for murder, I think is shocking. Could that sunshine summer break be coming closer? The latest plans to relax travel restrictions and... Do you want to take on a biscuit? Can I'll have a cake, please. Only hope when there's other people waiting. The joy of feeling useful, how helping has helped one care home resident. This is the ITV Evening News with Mary Nightingale. Good evening. The final harrowing moments of Dalian Atkinson's life were described in court today. The prosecution alleges the former footballer was tasered for 33 seconds by an angry police officer, who then kicked his head so hard, imprints of his shoelaces were left on his forehead. A second officer used her baton to beat Dalian as he lay on the ground. The 48-year-old, best known for playing for Aston Villa, died shortly afterwards in hospital. PC Benjamin Monk denies murder and PC Mary Ellen Betley Smith denies assault. From Birmingham, Crown Court, here's Ben Chapman. Atkinson on the pitch in an Aston Villa shirt. Dalian Atkinson was a hero to his fans. This, perhaps his finest moment. And that's a superb individual goal by Dalian Atkinson. But prosecutors say he died a victim of an unlawful attack by a police officer. PC Benjamin Monk of West Mercia Police is on trial accused of murdering him by tasering him excessively and then kicking him in the head as he lay on the ground. In August 2016, he and his colleague had been called to this street in Telford in the early hours of the morning. Dalian Atkinson had turned up at his father's house, behaving erratically, shouting in the street and claiming to be the Messiah. PC Monk used his taser on him twice but it didn't work. With Dalian Atkinson advancing towards him, the court was told PC Monk then fired his taser a third time. This time, keeping his finger on the trigger for 33 seconds. That's more than six times the standard amount, even as the former footballer fell to the ground. He is then accused of kicking him so hard that the imprint of his laces was left on Dalian Atkinson's forehead. He died an hour later. He'd been suffering serious health problems, including heart and kidney failure, but prosecutors say it was the taser and kicks that killed him, telling the jury, in kicking Dalian Atkinson to the head, PC Monk can only have intended to cause really serious injury. He was no doubt angry that he'd been put in fear by this man. He chose to take that anger out on Dalian Atkinson. PC Monk denies murder and manslaughter. His colleague, PC Mary Ellen Betley Smith, denies a charge of assault for repeatedly hitting Dalian Atkinson with her baton. They claim they were entitled to use reasonable force because they were afraid for their safety. But the prosecution says there are witnesses who saw Dalian Atkinson lying still and unresponsive on the ground. This afternoon, the jury was told the two officers were in a relationship at the time of the incident. The court also heard that when other officers arrived at the scene that night, one of them noticed that PC Monk had his foot resting on Dalian Atkinson's head. Police officers are allowed to use reasonable force to defend themselves. It will be up to the jury here to decide whether it was reasonable that night. Ben Chapman in Birmingham, thank you. Now, two former British paratroopers accused of murdering an IRA commander 50 years ago walked free from court today after the trial against them collapsed. The men, both aged in their 70s now, were formally acquitted of shooting Joe McCann in Belfast in 1972. But his family said the ruling did not mean that he wasn't murdered and they vowed to continue their search for justice. From Belfast, our correspondent Dan Rivers reports. 
This was a moment to be savoured by the supporters of soldiers A and C, delighted that the men they turned out for had been acquitted of murdering an IRA commander almost 50 years ago. I'm glad it happened the way it did. They deserved it. It's not right to take it out in the vet rooms now. They're over here doing their job. Well done, Johnny. Wives. Well done. Thanks for the support, guys. Right. Johnny, we'll get your... Former Veterans Minister Johnny Mercer had quit his job over cases like this. Today he was withering in his assessment of public prosecutors who pursued two former paras for the shooting of an IRA man, Joe McCann, in Belfast in 1972. They didn't come here on holiday. They came over here to prevent civil war. They served their country. Uh, and for them 50 years later to be in, in court uh, on the stand for murder uh, when it's already been investigated, there's no new evidence, right? All that's changed is the politics. There's no new evidence, I think is shocking. But for the family of Joe McCann, today was a difficult setback in their quest for justice. The judge was right when he used the word appalling to describe the failure of the state at all levels in relation to the murder of Joe McCann. The RUC failed, the criminal justice failed, not only in this case, but in the case of many other families. The shooting of IRA commander Joe McCann, pictured here with a rifle near to where he was shot, happened at the height of the troubles. British soldiers were engaged in a bloody conflict with the IRA. McCann was shot in the back as he tried to evade arrest. The paras weren't questioned by the police, the RUC. Instead, they were ordered to make statements to Royal Military Police without legal representation and not under caution. Those statements were at the heart of the prosecution case, but the judge ruled them inadmissible. The collapse of this case won't just be a huge relief to soldiers A and C, who are both now in their 70s, it may also have profound implications for dozens of other cases involving veterans who served here decades ago, whose actions are now being investigated with a view to prosecuting them. Dan Rivers, ITV News, Belfast. Now, there were more positive signs today that tourist hotspots could welcome back British visitors within weeks. Italy's Prime Minister said he expects tourism to reopen next month. And from the Foreign Office, here came a clue about which countries it may consider safe to travel to, as Richard Palo reports. It is still illegal to go on holiday, but there was a hint today about where soon it might become easiest to visit. The Foreign Office is no longer advising against non-essential travel to here in Portugal, the Canary Islands and some Greek islands. A government decision is due later this week. Julie doesn't know if her Italian wedding will be cancelled for a second year running. I think with the situation I'm in, we um, postponed from last year in good faith and we still don't know if we're going, whether it's going to be green, amber or red. Britons are expected to be allowed to travel abroad again from May the 17th. A traffic light system will class countries as green, amber or red, depending on factors, including coronavirus case rates. Places like Iceland, Portugal and Malta have low rates similar to the UK and are likely to be green. But they're far higher in holiday favourites, Spain, Greece or France. So for the moment, that's likely to mean quarantine from there on return. The travel agent Thomas Cook says bookings are up from midsummer, but even if the country is deemed low risk, holidaymakers will need to fork out for at least one pricey PCR test when back in the UK, something the company's boss questions. I would like to see, you know, looking at people who've been vaccinated more than once, you know, how, how much testing is really needed if they come back in from a green country. Um, children and parents who have been testing twice a week for the last three months, do they really need to be tested again? Uncertainty reigns. The European Commission would not confirm if UK citizens will be allowed to travel freely to the EU, with the British government being equally coy. I'd urge people to wait a few days uh, until we have that announcement and that will give people the details they need. Initially, not many will be given the green light, but by the summer, the options available should be significantly more enticing. Richard Palo, ITV News. 
At least 23 people, including children, have died in Mexico City after a metro overpass collapsed onto a busy highway. Dozens more were injured in the accident late on Monday night. Emergency teams worked through the night, searching the two carriages which still hung from their tracks over the road. An investigation is underway. Now, the Chief Constable of Kent Police says the force is doing everything it can to bring the killer of Officer Julia James to justice. The police community support officer was found murdered in Woodland near her home a week ago. But so far, there have been no arrests. Sergio Carrier is in Kent for us this evening. Sergio, more tributes being paid tonight. Yes, Mary, it's been seven days since PCSO Julia James was found dead in Woodlands at about half a mile from where I'm standing. And today, the Chief Constable of Kent Police, Alan Pusley, said the force was in deep shock and was determined to find out who did this. Police search teams have con are continuing to scour Ackholt Wood, where Ms James's body was found, trying to find clues as to who may have been responsible for her killing. So far, there have been no arrests and it appears no motive as to why Julia James was killed. The Chief Constable also said people living nearby should be very careful about going out alone after police in Kent shared similar messages, urging people to tell someone where they were going and to plan their route. This afternoon, a minute's silence was held in Julia James's memory and tonight from seven, people are being urged to light candles from their doorsteps. Sergio Carrier in Elsham, thank you. Still to come, the item for evening news, India's growing COVID crisis with cemetery space and vaccines in short supply. Plus, a special report from Scotland ahead of an election that could decide the future of the union. Those stories and more after the break. Join with them. And welcome back. There is growing pressure on India's Prime Minister to call for a full national lockdown to try to contain the spiralling COVID outbreak. The country has now recorded a total of more than 20 million cases, with deaths continuing to rise. And with the death toll so high, cemeteries are starting to run out of space, as our senior international correspondent John Irvine reports. While India's Hindus are short of wood to cremate their dead, the subcontinent's Muslims are running out of land in which to bury theirs. The Islamic graveyard of Jadid Kabristan is India's largest and Delhi's oldest. And because of coronavirus, it's now full. 97 years after the first funeral took place here, these were a few of the last burials, which we filmed with the family's permission. When I see relatives starting to cry, I can't help but cry too, said an overworked grave digger. I wish there was no need for a job like mine. <laughs> A rare sight, a queue of Indian people waiting to be vaccinated. On Saturday, everyone over the age of 18 became eligible. Vaccine is very important to uh, for our life savior. She's both right and very lucky. If one fact exposes government incompetence, it's that India is facing chronic vaccine shortages even though an Indian company, the Serum Institute, is the world's largest producer. The short-term prognosis for India is dire, not least because some experts believe there are 10 times as many infected people as official case numbers suggest. So even if there were no further infections tomorrow, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But we know that there will be even more infections tomorrow. So it's very devastating. <laughs> Another of the last funerals at the Delhi Cemetery. A mother whose son said the family's grief was compounded by the fact they weren't notified by the hospital and only found out she'd passed away when they went to visit her this morning. India is struggling 
to keep track of its dead. John Irvine, ITV News. Here, yeah, seven people have been injured after an explosion blew a hole in a row of houses in Kent this morning. Several people had to be freed by emergency services after becoming trapped. The incident is not being treated as suspicious. It's thought it was caused by gas. Now, the result of this week's elections for the Scottish Parliament could have a big impact on the whole of the UK. The Scottish National Party is hoping to win an outright majority and put even greater pressure on Westminster to allow a second independence referendum. Ahead of the polls opening, we're examining the arguments both for and against. And tonight we hear from pro-independence supporters on why they feel now is their moment. Our UK editor Paul Brand has this special report. Over the River Tay, the trains run to the usual timetable. But politics has accelerated here. Broughty Castle's seen its battles for control of Scotland, but perhaps none as decisive as this election. Those on the long walk to independence have found others joining them, believing the wind has changed in their direction. I remember waking up the day after the referendum and feeling glad that we'd voted no. But since then we've had the Brexit referendum and Brexit eventually made me decide that the people of Scotland should be deciding our future and not governments we don't vote for. It's changed the equation for you? It's absolutely changed the equation for me. Do you think Covid has emboldened Scotland to go its own way? We've been saying for a long time that Scotland could do things differently and suddenly this is actually show not tell. You know, we're actually seeing that we can make decisions in the best interests of our communities. I think the Scottish Government has definitely handled Covid so much better than Boris and his bunch in London. I mean, Do you think Boris Johnson is your greatest asset in terms of getting independence? He's a great asset for us, yeah. We want Boris to stay. And maybe if they could make, uh, I don't know, re-smog the minister in charge of Scotland, that would be even better. An independent mindset isn't just ancient but recent history here. The vote for Scottish separation was higher in Dundee than anywhere else in 2014. That referendum was billed as once in a generation, but the question in this election is whether so much has changed since then that that time has effectively elapsed. But while life in Dundee undoubtedly looks different, for these university students, Many of the same arguments remain at play. If the union has no future, what does that mean for theirs? What does your heart say? My heart says that independence would give us an opportunity for our independent views to be listened to, but we're not a big enough or a strong enough country that it would ever work. I just feel like it could be a bit too soon to vote, to have an re um, independence referendum so soon again. I don't think England does treat Scottish people very well and sometimes like vice versa as well. So it's a nice idea of being united, but are we really? Rather than providing an answer about the future of the union, Thursday's election could begin a process which questions it once again. Paul Brand, ITV News, Dundee. And tomorrow, Paul will be hearing from those who feel equally as strongly that Scotland should stay in the union. And finally tonight, the care home resident who switched places to help care for others. Maureen Townend liked Flower Park Care Home in Doncaster so much, she asked to become an assistant. And now the 83-year-old is a regular volunteer. Maureen told Lucy Watson why she just can't help helping. Do you want a cake or a biscuit? It's a unique style of customer service adopted by Maureen Townend, Flower Park Care Home's newest recruit. You can either have a bun or a biscuit, there's only one biscuit. Maureen decided only last week she wanted a change, a job, turning her from resident to volunteer care worker, looking after others and keeping the home in order. It's not a case of being tired, it's me. Right from being little, me, me, if my mum were here, she'd tell you when I was four, she said, I used to be trotting around with women, little brush and that, going all over the place. You're 83, Maureen. Don't you think it's time for a rest? I do rest. I rest all day. <laughs> I rest hours and hours. Born and bred in Doncaster, she refuses to think of it as work. I don't work at all. I only keep my house nice. 
I do keep my house nice. Maureen has only lived here since March and has already made an impression. How would you describe her to me? Well, she, she's a sociable. She's, she likes to talk. What do you think of Maureen? Well, she's not, she's not bad for her age. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think she brings to the care She's a breath of fresh air. For her, it's been able to get up every morning and have a reason to get up and out of bed and have a purpose and be thanked and be useful. I'll come back if there's any spare. And her sharp tongue provides plenty of amusement. Do you want another biscuit, one. Sarah? I've had one. You don't want another now? No, no, oh, because we shan't be back. Lucy Watson, ITV News, Doncaster. Have you have got one? <laughs> and that's all for now. Raggy's here at 10. From me and all the team, bye-bye.